So what happened with John Jones? Is he like trying to say that he failed another drug test or something? Mm-mm. Or is that well, not that I heard of? Or they, is this a lot of old footage that they're yeah. talking about? And then him and Stipe are supposed to fight in July. I was listening to a podcast that he did. After all that, right? He was pretty mo- emotional about it. Is how talk about how he had to start back from ground zero. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and they said that like the amount of stuff they found in his system. They said if you take an Olympic sized swimming pool and you drop one grain of salt in it, that's what they found in the system. It's like, damn, that's. For like, to me, like, it wasn't even, what was it, Coke? It, what, one of them, I can't remember the name, they found a P, like the picogram or whatever, was some, was some PED. Poirier, he's one of my favorite. Like, uh, Poirier's probably, probably my favorite, besides John Jones. Mm-hmm. He's, he's probably my favorite active fighter. The guy just did the podcast with Caleb Holloway. He looks just like him. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Welcome back to the TBM Podcast. I'm your host, Gunnar Michelli. And today we brought on Mr. Blake Trahan. So I heard about his stories and stuff and uh, very interested in him. And then later on when I started the podcast, I've, I've been thinking about it for a while, trying to have him on, but I didn't know how to approach him. I finally hit him up, grew some balls, hit him up, and asked him to come on my pod- podcast. All right. So Blake, so tell us a little bit about your childhood and um, how that translated into you going into the military. Uh, childhood was pretty normal. Uh, a lot of people that go in the infantry, you know, they have a, a background of, you know, bad childhood or bad mm-hmm. upbringing. I, don't, I didn't really have that. Uh, I was a mama's boy. Uh, dad worked a lot. He was a good provider. They got split up when I was in third grade, I think they got divorced. Mm-hmm. Uh, grew up here in Sour Lake, went to Hard jefferson graduated high school. And then I, uh, school was always easy for me, but I didn't put my effort into it really like I should. So once I got into college, it turned into more of a, a partying time. Uh, for sure I ended up getting you know I don't consider weed bad but I, I smoked a lot of weed I ended up getting bad on some other drugs and made the decision that if I stayed on that path I was probably going to end up in a bad spot so I was either going to move or join the military uh, decided to join the military and uh, told my mom I wouldn't go infantry and that's exactly <laughs> what I did so that's how that happened <laughs> that was the one promise she made me make I said if okay you can go I'll be okay with it just don't join infantry well, I did this. My parent, my my parents really didn't want me to. They supported it once I because they knew I was going to do it just from my childhood. Like I always thought I talked about, but my grandma she hated it. She hated the idea of it, everything about it. But I even made like um, a song growing up. I was just an aggravator. I was like something like "Bye Bye BB." I'm going to Marine Corps Infantry because we called her BB, and uh, it always get her so worked up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's wild and. And that persona of people, like, you know, having bad childhoods is normally the infantry is where they end up. It's either that or prison. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was kind of, I was exactly the same. I had a very good childhood. Mm-hmm. And I, all the trouble that I got in was because of me. It wasn't because of oh, my yeah. parents, you know. Yeah. I just made bad decisions. Yeah. But so where did you go to boot camp or basic training? Uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Fort Benning? Yeah. And y'all, how long is that, that process well, for y'all? with infantry, basic training and infantry school is all intertwined. If you don't go infantry, I think you go to basic training for... 12 weeks or something like that and then you go to your your training for whatever your MOS is after uh, infantry school is kind of intertwined so I want to say we did like 16 or 18 weeks something like that really we're on there yeah boot camp for us what is it it's 14 weeks and our ITB training is 14 weeks yeah. so it's like 28 weeks in total yeah so it's a it's a while yeah it was then, a long time then right after that you went to the first unit yep the 101st airborne yep yeah what I was, was in the uh, first brigade uh, first 327 Infantry Regiment uh, at Fort Campbell. Yeah, that was the that was my one and only. So how was that? How was that unit? Like y'all's tradition and pride and culture and traditions? It was cool. Like, I I, I didn't know a whole lot about it at first. I mean, I knew the, the history of it, 101st, you know, but I got there and it was just as uh, just as high speed, I guess you want to say. They made it sound, you know. And, yeah. Uh, a lot of running uh, and a lot of pride and the history and all that stuff. So it was cool. How, how much did they focus on y'all's combat training? Because, like, that was, like, when you went in <laughs> during, like, the heat of Afghanistan. Yeah. When things were getting real serious. Well, I got I got to, I got to the, the my unit in January. We deployed in May, so I didn't have a whole lot of time. So everything was kind of wrapping up as far as getting ready for deployment. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh, we did, we did the, uh, we did one big training in Fort Polk, Louisiana. 
And besides that, I got to hit a couple a couple ranges, and then it was, hey, we're packing our stuff, and we're we're going. To was that already a planned deployment? Or yeah, okay, yeah. And so, um, were you nervous going into that, knowing you didn't have the, like a full workup? A little bit. Uh, I mean, like I said, I didn't have a bad childhood, so I'd never been shot at. So mm -hmm. you know, um, I think we talked the other day about it. my very first live fire. I didn't get a live fire training exercise. My very first live fire was the first time first firefight in Afghanistan. That's so, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that is nuts. I thought I was ready for it, but it ended up being different. <laughs> it ended up being different than I was expecting. That's wild. So now, so you're going to Afghanistan. And so what unit was there prior to y'all? Uh, I want to say we replaced 4th ID from Colorado. And what was y'all's exact location where y'all deployed to? We were, we were at Cop, Michigan. It was in the Pesh River Valley, uh, right at the mouth of the Corn Gulf. Really? And so did y'all, y'all knew y'all was going there? Yeah. And so what was kind of like the stories and like? Uh, we, knew, knew. we knew that they had shut down Restrepo. I don't remember when exactly they shut it down, but uh, we had been told that a lot of the Taliban from that area had pushed towards where we were going. Uh, it was very minimal. They didn't tell us a whole lot, but we knew it was going to be fairly kinetic. We knew mm -hmm. it was going to be a pretty, good, pretty what, good spot. Was things worse or better than what y'all pictured? Uh, in my head, it was worse 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 as far as more more kinetic mm -hmm. um i didn't think it would be like that and you know we there were a lot of people in my unit that had had previous deployments this was obviously my first one a lot of our first ones and um so we kind of heard stories from them from iraq and other times they went to afghanistan but uh nobody had really gone through anything like like that one really and so um i guess we could t take a time and talk about kind of the movie and promote that and um, so there's a movie out there called uh, Pet River Boys, mm -hmm. and it goes and talks about their experience, a lot of uh, combat footage with their helmet cams and stuff. And um, cause tell that story real quick. Yeah, uh, whenever I got out, I tried to find an outlet, and uh, jiu-jitsu ended up being uh, a big thing for me. Uh, I joined, and my jiu-jitsu instructor, uh, Jason Ebarb, he's actually the producer of the movie, He's uh, really big on military history and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't talk to a whole lot of people about it, but over time I kind of realized, you know, how interested he was in it. And then uh, me and him got to be really good friends, and so I started opening up a little bit more. And then uh, it turned into what it did. At first it was just going to be something small. We were going to film in his house, fly a few of my friends in, and uh, him just ask us questions, just something to have on tape, you know, mm -hmm. for our kids or later on down the road. And uh, he ended up hooking up with a – production team from Louisiana who a mutual friend had used for a music video and uh, we showed them the helmet cam footage and all that stuff and they wanted to like sit down and make it as you know wanted to make it a good production out of it so they did um, and even still we didn't think it was going to be that big of you know didn't think it was going to be huge mm -hmm. but there's a Facebook group called Funker 530 mm -hmm. and they got a hold of the uh, the trailer they put out the trailer for the movie and once they shared it it blew up I mean it it went and like I don't remember how many countries like we went worldwide like viral, and so then we it turned into a way bigger deal than we thought it was going to. Funker five thirty that's a huge platform. Yeah, a huge yeah. platform. But um, that so funny story like we trained so the Ebar brothers opened a branch in Nacogdoches TPC, and um, we trained with them for a while until they shut down. But and so that movie um, you can find it on on Vimeo. Vimeo. Yeah. And uh, you pay for it. But all that's going to a good cause. It's it's all for um, – it's a reunion, right? That that's what we're working towards, yeah. All the money gets put into a, the Pesh River Boys Fund, and um, we're hoping that once we get some, maybe do a couple more fundraisers and uh, try to get a reunion together. I'd like to help you all do something. Yeah, it'd be cool. Um, so that's that, and now let's get into the actual story of it. And so we're, going, we're not going to talk a lot about the combat footage. We're going to talk mainly about the time <clears throat> after, but I want, uh, you know, a painted picture for the viewers to – you know, kind of experience, which, well, they won't experience it, but just kind of realize what, how bad it was. Yeah. And so, um, Corngall Valley, if you don't know what the Corngall Valley, they called it, uh, what was it? There is like the Death Valley. Yep. Death Valley. <clears throat> and it was the most kinetic place you can ever go in Afghanistan. The most dangerous place, most kinetic place. It was just, the, not only the, how bad, how much Taliban there was there, but it was the terrain. Yeah. And so, if you want to go kind of explain the Corngall, yeah, like you said, the terrain was, I mean, you've been to Afghanistan, so you know, like, we landed in 
uh, Bagram first and then went to Jalalabad. And you can see the mountains off in the distance. You know, like, man, those are crazy. But mm -hmm. then we got to Cop, Michigan. You're down in a fishbowl, and there's mountains 360. You know, you're surrounded, and you just look up, and you – you can't see the top of them. You think you see the top of them. You climb up there, you get there, and it's just a false peak. And they just keep going, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, the terrain was by far on their I mean, they it was on their side for sure. They had the upper hand as far as the terrain. And because, I mean, isn't uh, the corn gall like where, like, the Russian, like, when mm -hmm. the Russians came, that's one of their, like, they got obliterated there. Yep. Um, so, whenever you landed uh, in Afghanistan, whatever, and you went to kind of to y'all's, to Cop, Michigan, what was y'all's first day like? Well, we landed at night because the birds wouldn't land there during the day. So Chinook landed, uh, let us off, let some of the 4th ID guys go. Uh, and it was dark, didn't know our way around it. There was HESCO bears everywhere. So they, we ended up just going into this room, had a bunch of pillows and didn't think much of it. We were, our first night, I think there was like five or six of us in there. And we just laid on these pillows, all sprawled out, and then uh, come to find out that's the room they brought all the village elders in and all these Afghanis and like we're laying on their pillows and stuff and Oof. didn't even know it. But, uh, woke up the next day to mortars. Um, it was outgoing. Uh, the guys who had got there a few days before us were out on a mission and they got hit not far from the cop. And so it was our guys firing mortars, trying to support them. That's what woke us up. That's wild. And so then that, so when did your whole unit get there? Like did it was like over a week's time, a couple weeks. Yeah. A couple weeks spread out. Yeah. And then there was, like, you know, the 4th ID guys would, you know, debrief a lot and talk about different places they went and things they tried to accomplish. And we actually, before they all left, we ran a big mission with them. Um, it was mainly for terrain and getting a bird's eye view of everything, but we got into a Chinook, and they took us up so high your ears were popping, you know, and then we had to walk down. But we got to see all the terrain and higher up from a – from way up top to see what we were really looking at. Did y'all get any uh, into contact? Not that, that day, no. No, we didn't. Not that day. But um, definitely that first night, waking up to outgoing mortars, that definitely set the tone for y'all's whole deployment. For sure, yeah. Was that the time where you kind of had like an oh shit moment, or was that later on? Kind of. Uh, I was like, man, this is okay. It's real, you know. <laughs> and then uh, our guys came back, and we talked to them, and it's almost like, a, it's like looking at a guy like, Dang, man, you're a badass now. You got into a firefight, you know? <laughs> but, and then he come, most of them, did, it wasn't their first firefight. You know, they've been to Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They came back. It's like, man, we're here. It's time. Let's go. This is what it's going to be like for the next year. <laughs> so, and it literally was, but, yeah. but probably much worse. Yeah. So um, kind of tell, like, what was y'all's mission set there? What did they kind of? From what we were told, I mean, goals. they were trying to, they were trying to set up a government for the country, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mainly in Jalalabad and all the big, all the big cities. Uh, and we were supposed to be kind of like a buffer to stop fighters from moving towards that area and stop elections and all that. And also to help try to train the Afghan national army. Mm -hmm. So, and so did y'all do much training on that, uh, army, Afghan army side, or did y'all do mainly? Not really. Really? I mean, we, we tried to get it to the point where they would take lead on a lot of missions and it just, that never really worked out very well. So we were always, First in, and uh, but we tried every now and then. There, there was a couple of them that were decent, but most of them were. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'd, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, how to paint this picture of the um, your time there, if you wouldn't mind. So I'm just gonna let you kind of do your thing, and like, if there's any of uh, like more detailed questions, I'll ask. But like, I don't know how to ask that. So, <laughs> man, it was just a, it was just a long year, man. It, I mean, every day. Every day, just about, there was a firefight, whether that's, you know, base security, they're shooting RPGs at the base and we're just kind of firing back, or um, we did a lot of, uh, I guess you would call it, we even did missions that our LT would call movement to contact, where we just climb a mountain until we got shot at, just to see where they were at. Mm -hmm. um, we did presence patrols, we'd get hit in the bazaar, we'd get hit trying to climb up to the OP, and the OP was actually the biggest part of our um, deployment. We had a... There was a mountain right outside of the cop that we would climb out and go up, and we would rotate out every week or two. We'd stay up there for a week or two, and then we'd rotate out. And uh, that was the buffer for the cop. You know, that was into the Korangal Valley, so we'd be fighting into the Korangal. And, uh, I mean, you, you know, that's guaranteed every day up there, you know. So 
a lot of firefights, uh, RPGs. It was a, it was very kinetic. And I think it was part of the movie. I think we even talked about it. If, if we went more than a day or two without something happening, and then we knew that something big, they were planning for something. Or And really the only time it went more than a couple of days was during Ramadan. They kind of took that time period off. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after Ramadan was pretty intense too. They came back. Yeah. And so um, how many casualties did y'all take? In our platoon, let's see, we only lost one person from our platoon. Uh, there were several casualties. Um, a bunch of guys got hit in the arm, the, the shoulder. Castro got shot on election day at the OP in the shoulder. Uh, Sergeant Burkhardt, our platoon sergeant, got shot in the hand. There was a lot. There were a bunch of casualties. Uh, Ut, Specialist Ut, he was our first casualty, I think, uh, just a few weeks after being there. Climbing up to the OP, he got hit uh, in the arm. Um, and that was a crazy one. It, it hit him in the arm, and then the bullet traveled into his arm, into his chest, bounced around a little bit, and then went back into his arm. So he had he lost all kind of really motion in his arm yeah that sucks yeah and you know your story about your brother that you know got killed man mm -hmm. uh, the vision story well uh, man you had me rock harder yeah talking about that going into the village and yeah. just wiping everything out yeah man I, I don't have that experience and um it's wild and but it seems like he was jam up though you know talking good about yeah. him and stuff but uh sorry you had to experience that because that's not fun for anybody. And it's yeah. definitely probably, you know, when you're in the middle of a deployment. Well, y'all's about to leave when that happened, correct? Yeah, we're a month away from leaving. And, so. you, and just having to be able to continue on and stuff, that would have been difficult. You yeah. Know, keeping that morale up. Yeah, because, I mean, other, the, other, the other platoons, we were Bravo Company. There was an infantry platoon from Bravo Company, Charlie Company, and Delta Company. So there are three infantry platoons there. Um, the other platoons lost people also. I mean, we lost people um, that were uh, – like mechanics and stuff and that like we got hit on the base all the time and somebody just got hit through where they were working on a truck uh stuff like that so man if there was anything that you you know kind of took away from that deployment you know as volatile and as kinetic as it was what would you say would be the biggest thing uh that i can or anybody can deal with a lot more than they think they can yeah when you're forced to it's a the, the brain, your mind is a very, very strong thing. Very strong. And so when did you start realizing that? <laughs> After everything was already over? Mm -mm. Mm. It's kind of hard to think of it while you're in it, you know, mm -hmm. exactly what's going on. But uh, there were several times. There was one day where we got, we got hit pretty hard at the OP. And then it went from, like, because at first, you know, it, it was pretty intense the first couple months, two or three months. And uh, then you just start, it's weird, the shit you get used to, you know, you just, it's, this is normal, this is what's going to happen today. And then one time we got hit really hard, uh, and there's, I think we have a clip of it. Uh, you can hear the bullets whizzing by, and we all just kind of get down into the, into the pit, the 50 cal pit underneath, and the sandbags, and we just start, we just start laughing. Mm -hmm. And so whenever everybody started laughing at what was happening, I was like, man, we're, we're probably going to be pretty fucked up after this. <laughs> <laughs> this something that most people would laugh at. You know? I remember you telling that story. He was like, yeah, at that moment, like, I pretty much knew I'm going to be yeah. fucked after yeah. this. That's awesome. But, and now we're going to talk about the hard stuff that no one wants to talk about. That's not talked about, you know, very often because, you know, we're men and there's awful, obviously this persona that we carry that, you know, uh, we're invincible. And it's not even that we're invincible with, you know, physical things, but emotional things, you know. And it's a dangerous place to be in. So when you got home, you know, what was kind of your emotions? I'd probably say the first month. Uh, the first month, honestly, I was just – the first month I felt like went pretty pretty good. Uh, just happy to be home. Uh, whenever we landed, you know, my family was there. My wife now, she was there. Uh, we weren't married yet, but um, – and that first month, just about, I think she stayed up there with me. Like, we went from hotel to hotel just because we started at a nice hotel. And we stayed there for a week or a week or a weekend. And every every week it seemed like we downgraded because we were running out of money. <laughs> we were just staying in hotel after hotel. And she stayed up there for like a month, I think. Um, so that was nice. And it was very minimal stuff on base after, you know, for the first month. Mm -hmm. A lot of debrief and in processing and getting our equipment and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. the first month really wasn't too bad. So when did you get, did you get married while you were still in? Yeah. Yeah. You we did. got married. That was before she actually moved up there. Um, she moved up there uh, probably 
six months or so after we got home, not quite six months. And we got married really quick after that, really fast. I uh, know a lot of people probably know that you don't get the extra BAH pay unless you're married. Mm -hmm. So she moved up there, and we got an apartment, even though we weren't married yet, and uh, found out that we just weren't making enough money to support yeah. anything. So, like, well, I love you, you love me, you know, let's just let's get married. We're not wasting your time, yeah. yeah. And so that's what we did. We uh, did Justice of the Peace, but he was cool about it. He met us down by the, by the, a river in Clarksville, Tennessee. We got married at the river. Really? With a bunch of people. Yeah, it was cool. That is cool. And did y'all ever do like a ceremony after? Mm -hmm. Me and my wife. We planned on it. We planned on it. Me and my wife did that. We got, you know, married by the Justice yeah. of the Peace too. And we have, we've we been planning a wedding or like an event for the past three years. So yeah. It's probably never going to happen. Plan, that's, that's <laughs> what we, I mean, we even talked about it for our 10 because we've been married for 11 years now. But we, we were talking about it for our 10 year. Like, man, let's do something, you know, not not necessarily a big wedding ceremony, but like a reception where we can have friends and family and all that. But Bro, you got this badass backyard in the shop now. <laughs> yeah. you, you're in the perfect spot to yeah, do something. We can, well, I'm sure we'll make something happen one day. <laughs> but so, you know, because you got out not too long after you yeah. got back from your first deployment. Yeah. And so kind of see that in my perspective, too, with the same experience of, you know, because I went, I did two deployments to Afghanistan. So, but my second deployment to Afghanistan, when I got back, like I just had like a couple of months and I was processed out, you know, because yeah. my time was up and things really didn't start getting bad until like I came home and probably six months set in and all the, like the fun was done and or probably more or less a year. No, it was probably six months. And like, I finally got, had some self-reflection. He goes, and I was like, man, my purpose is gone. Yeah. What am I going to do now? You know, which I, I was already going to the fire academy and stuff, but it still wasn't the same. Yeah. And kind of like, did you, is that the kind of your initial feelings? Like you feel like you just lost your purpose? A little bit, a little bit of the purpose. Uh, I was just angry and I didn't have a good reason why. Uh, yeah, I was just mad and little things that like right now, if they happen, they wouldn't make me mad at all. You mm -hmm. know, just think I, I was just angry. Very angry. Do you, what do you think? Survivor's guilt was like there part was, of that? There was definitely some survivor's guilt. Um, looking back on it now, you know, I mean, I know it's a normal thing, but I was just, I, I wasn't good at, uh, how can I put it? I guess I just wasn't good at compartmentalizing stuff. Like I didn't, I didn't know where to separate certain things and just everything just seemed like a blur. Like even now thinking back on those days, mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's 100%. a blur. I mean. I don't remember a lot of stuff, even like I, I don't remember a lot of the times, like exactly what happened in the bad time, like in arguments or in if I got into a fight. I don't remember a lot of it. You know, I remember the things that some of the things I said and how I made people feel or things that I did. You know, I remember that, you know, after the fact. But in the moment, I don't I mean, it's a blur. And I like you talking about being angry, bro. That is like spitting image of like how I felt. And I think it was a plethora of things because uh, I didn't lose nobody, but it's just like one of it, you know, um, the void. But another thing was like, bro, we're, we're weak over here. Yeah. Like, look how cushy we got it. And these fucking four-year-old kids are literally, I remember this one little girl, she would take her little water buckets and carry your donkey, donkey to the water hole on my first deployment and like fill her little donkeys up and walk away. Yeah. And, you know, like. The, the culture and the life over there is just humbling. Oh, yeah. The way that they lived and stuff. And we get upset and people are so just, I don't know, like um, selfish and kind of just brats, if you will, and just spoiled here. And it's just like you see that and you see what you've seen, what you've been through, and just like, bro, like. Yeah. Here, adults are just as bad as kids. Bro, I mean, it is. Adults, it, they are. Adults are, adults are just as spoiled as the kids are these and, days. I remember that pissing me off. Yeah. That pissing me off. Then, like, I'd go to the bar and drink and stuff, and, bro, it, I'd get mad about something stupid, and I'm fighting everybody. Yeah. In which I probably did that before I went yeah. to the military, but it didn't make it any better. No. And so um, what other, like, instead of being angry, what are, like, some other, like, emotions that you felt? Or, like, uh, you'd say, like, things that you were kind of dealing with besides, like, the survivor's guilt and kind of just being angered. Even though I know I wasn't, looking back on it now, because, I mean, I had my wife, I had my friends, I had my family, I just felt alone. Like, I didn't feel like anybody understood me. I didn't feel like, um, I don't know, it's almost like I, I felt like I walked around with, like, a like a cloud over me, you know? Like, I felt like people mm -hmm. were looking at me mm -hmm. in a weird way. Um, 
didn't understand me, which I mean, I didn't understand myself, too, you know, mm-hmm. so I can't blame them for that. But uh, yeah, I just I felt alone and uh, I felt guilty. I didn't feel like I deserved anybody's love or I didn't I didn't really know how to give love um, to my wife, to my family, my friends. Uh, I think the, the yeah, the main thing for me was just not feeling like I deserved any of it. Mm-hmm. So I got into a really bad spot where I would push people away like purposely, like self-sabotage mm-hmm. and all that stuff. I do that, that's, that was one of the biggest things that I took away from our conversation is that, was that there? And I couldn't, I, now that I think about it, like I can't pinpoint where that came from. Yeah. I don't, I can't pinpoint, I can't pinpoint if it was like previous life experiences, you know, that, you know, going to country or whatever, I just, I couldn't pinpoint that emotions cause like I had no reason to feel that way, yeah. you know? And um, I felt the same way. Like, I feel like you walk into Walmart and everyone's staring at mm-hmm. you like you're, like, some, yep. I don't know, criminal villain or just yep. retarded. For no reason. For no reason. <clears throat> and, like, um, people would try to contact you. Like, wanna hang, like my buddies would always want to hang out and stuff, but I just don't want to go hang out with nobody. I didn't want to yeah. go be around them. It's because, you know, like, I felt the same. Like, I felt like no one understands me. Like, no one cares. No, like, no one gives a shit, yeah. you know. Then, like, and that was, the, that was another one. No one gives a shit, you know, even though they did. They felt like, especially the ones that are really close to you, they mm. did, they did give a shit. They did want to get in there and talk to you and, you know, be your person or whatever. And you just, like, just like, fuck, I don't deserve that. I don't, you know, and I would just push them away. And, bro, and it's dangerous. Yeah. And the self-sabotaging, and that is, like, something I still see myself now doing, mm-hmm. you know, like, especially after that conversation, like, I like you said the self-sabotage, I'm like, bro, like, whenever, you know, me and my wife get in arguments, like, it's over something stupid, Most but like I self sabotage myself so bad, and I like because I like I get upset that we got in a, like a little argument. Then I was like I, like I just I feel like I ruined her day. Then I feel like I don't deserve her. Then I, I go lay in the bed for four days. Yeah. Then I show up to work and like act like nothing ever happened. Then like I'm there and I'm just because like one thing I do when I go to work, I make sure I'm a hundred percent. No one deserves for me to be in a bad mood or no one cares about it. like community don't care if I'm having yeah. a bad day or not. Yeah. They need me at my 110. Yeah. And so I always instill that but when, you know, like deep down, like, you know, I'm depressed and sad and stuff. But yeah. that self sabotaging thing is a very dangerous mm-hmm. piece because like that's when you have to start having the mother thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, you for know? you. It's dangerous for you. It's hurtful to the people around you. Um, you hurt people that love you, you you know, and you hurt them you sometimes you hurt them bad, you know. And you kind of, I don't know how much you want to talk about our last conversation, but kind of, if you want to, like, explain your piece with that. Because you had, like, some very good articulate words to say about it. Yeah. Uh, man, it's just, like I said, I, I didn't feel like I deserved, like, my wife is a godsend, man. Like, she, the things that we went through together and the things that I put her through, nobody else would have stayed. Uh, and she did. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll never be able to, to live up to what she deserves. I feel the same. But, uh, yeah, it was just, it was a lot of, uh, like I said earlier, just anger and man, I would, I would break people down, her included, uh, break them down mentally. Like I would, it was a lot of verbal abuse. Um, one thing we talked about the other night was, uh, like something they teach you in the military, you know, especially in the infantry, if you. The only way to defeat something that's coming at you is to overpower it. So if you have something coming at you, people firing at you, you got to overpower them with more fire, right? Mm-hmm. And it was the same in an argument. Like if I felt like somebody was coming at me in a certain way just to win the argument, I would overpower that with, like you said, something hurt my feelings, I'm hurt your feelings mm-hmm. 10 times worse. You know, just that stupid, terrible mentality. That's, I had that for a long time. Uh, and my wife caught the brunt end of that because she was the one that I was with most of the time, you mm-hmm. know? I've had pretty much one best friend since for the last 20 something years, you know, besides him, you know, I lost a bunch of friends and not just because of that stuff, just like life in general, you know, but, um, he stayed, she stayed, my family still around me, loved me. And now, you know, now I know that I deserve it. And it was just a, and it took, it took me a long time. What was that switch that you thought, you know, like I'm fucked up. Like now I didn't, like, I do deserve this. Like, my, like, your whole mentality changed. For me, it was time. Like, it, it wasn't, like, I mean, yeah, there were, there were certain events that I was like, fuck, I, I, gotta, I gotta stop. I have to stop doing mm-hmm. that. 
there were definitely certain events, but like for whatever reason, it took me, it took me a long time to, to believe it. You know, I would tell myself a lot for, you know, like you deserve it. Everything's gonna be okay. Um, stop pushing people away. They do love you. But like, I just, it's like, I knew it in here, but I didn't, I didn't react the right way. And it took me a long time to me. It was, it was a long 10 years probably of, you know, and it progressively got better in little baby steps, you know, but, uh, it was tough. And one thing, like I noticed stuff, something that I do, and it's very a toxic trait, and I feel so bad for Cassidy, is whenever we get an argument and stuff, and it'd be my fault. Because after that conversation, bro, like I validated 99% of our fights mm-hmm. was because of me. Oh, yeah. And that, like, bro, and I, that really fucked me bad. Yeah. Like, I, I had a feeling it was me, but it's just like, like, you really validated that I was a problem. Yeah. And so, like, you know, through self reflection and stuff, I kept on thinking about it, thinking about it. I'm like, bro, like I victimized my, I victimized myself yeah. through most of these arguments and stuff, yeah. and like, and it's like, it'd be something that I said or something that I did wrong, but now I'm trying to make, like, make her believe that yeah. she was the fault of that. Yep. And bro, that's such a toxic trait. And it is. The finger pointing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's bad. No matter who's doing it, it's 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 a bad thing. And to be able to to say, you know what, you're right. Swallow your pride for a second. Stop the argument. Give him a hug if you can. It's hard to do in the middle of it. It's very hard to do, but that's it's that victimizing is it's not going to get you anywhere. Mm-hmm. So where in like during your time did you have your daughter? Like a couple we years had, after you got back. Well, right after I got out, um, we found out that my wife was pregnant. Uh, I got out in October of 2012, and we I think we found out in November mm-hmm. that she was pregnant. Wow. So. It was pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, when she, our daughter came a month early, she was born in June of 2013. Um, and that was another one of those moments, you know, I was like, man, I gotta, you know, it was still really early and it still took me a long time to change, but I, like something, something with her clicked, you know, that with my daughter, like I, that's one person that I never pushed away. That's one person that I always gave 110% to. She's got me wrapped around her little finger. She's about to be 10 years old now. You know, that's she she might have heard some arguments, I'm sure, in her room before, you know, but as far as me and her, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's that's one thing I will say that I never let that spill over to her. That was one thing I was going to ask. I was like, her existence changed you at all? It did. Um, I mean, definitely more so now, but, um, but then it's like a, it didn't, it didn't help me in other ways as far as my, me and my wife and things that we went through or me and friends and pushing other people away. But it did give me a sense of now that love right there. That's, Mm -hmm. that's, that's real right there. The way I feel for her, the way, and I wanted her to feel the way, you know, I wanted, you have a daughter, right? Yeah. Every guy wants a, most guys want a boy, you know, and I did for a long time. Uh, and then we had a girl and, I wouldn't even know what to do with a boy now. I don't even <laughs> want a boy now. You know, it's just I I want to be the first person that she loves. Mm-hmm. I want to be her hero. I want to be all that for her. And so even even with all the other stuff, I was able. That's I, probably with her. That's probably the first thing I was able to compartmentalize with her and mine and her relationship. I was able to to separate everything else. And for mm-hmm. the longest time, I didn't want her to know I was in the military. Mm-hmm. It just. I didn't want the baggage that came with it. You know, I just wanted me and her, and that's mm-hmm. it. And so how hard – this had to been hard. Like, how hard was your, that battle to keep her away from your feelings that you oh, really felt? It was hard. And <clears throat> I think for me what was really hard is, like, knowing that she's a couple rooms away while me and her mom are screaming at each other, you know, because you always want to to be an example, mm-hmm. especially as a, as a girl dad – of the kind of man you want your girl, your daughter to marry, right? Mm-hmm. And I was not that for mm-hmm. a long time. Um, so that part was hard. Knowing, like even knowing, I still couldn't, I still couldn't change. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was still struggling with it. But if it was just me and her, man, that it, that part of me was just gone. Like I, I, it was just gone. She melted it away. Does she ask now about your military experience? Or? Some, uh, I mean, little kid questions. You mm-hmm. know, Daddy, did you carry a gun? Mm-hmm. And you know, all that stuff. And she'll come to me about uh, some of her friends whose parents were in the military and uh, talk about them going to get bad guys and all that stuff. And it's cute. It's a little yeah. harmless stuff, you know. And I say, yeah, that's what the military does. Mm-hmm. She doesn't, obviously, doesn't yeah. know anything what actually happened. But, uh, 
Yeah, she's the best, man. Um, and that that's you know about I, well, if I ever had a girl, I mean, if I ever had kids, I want a girl too. Yeah, I want to be a girl dad, bad, because one of my best friend at work, he uh, he's a he's a girl dad. He's he thinks the same as you. Like he said, he wouldn't know what to do with the little dude. Boy. I would have, I would be lost. I'd be so lost. And I I tell my buddy, my best friend, I was like, <clears throat> one day he he's he doesn't he's right now he's in a spot where he doesn't want kids. I was like, well. I think you're going to, and I think you're going to have a girl, because that's what you deserve. <laughs> that's what you deserve. That she's going to have you wrapped, and all that, all the, all that stuff is just going to melt away. And that's, I mean, that's what it does for me. I mean, I just don't know how you could. Like, you look at something so precious Ugh. and so innocent, you know, like, it's, if with you're having the, a bad day, you can't. With a boy, I'd, I feel like I'd be more of a hard ass, like maybe even too oh, strict, sure. you know? Oh, for sure. With her, it's just like, I want to be, I want to be the good guy. Like if mama's, if mama's yelling at me, then I want to be the dad where it's like, come here, baby. I'll make you feel better. My mean old mama. Yeah, she does you know? no wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she does no wrong. Yeah. I feel like I'd be that way too. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing that's hard now. You know, it's like whenever she gets in trouble with, with she doesn't get in trouble with me very often, which might not be a good thing, but uh, <laughs> you know, if she does get in trouble, it's hard, It's so hard for me not to, like when she goes crying into her room, it's so hard for me to, stick to my wife's side it's i would just want to go into her room and hold her and just be like it's, it's gonna be okay i promise it's gonna be okay <laughs> and your but, wife in the meantime like, <laughs> yeah, want to beat you oh up. yeah then she, yeah yeah then i get to hear it from her which i mean i get it i mean you gotta you gotta stand your ground with them or they're oh, just gonna 100%. know what they can get away with you know but yeah, it's probably. She, she's a good kid we're lucky she's a good kid so when you're going when you was coming home and well when you came home and you started to experience these emotions like would you have any of your like military brothers like try to reach out to you or would you kind of push them back as well there's i mean i pushed a lot of them away but at the same time there weren't very many of them to push away like everybody kind of went not everybody but a lot of us kind of went our own way um and that's you know that kind of sucks but at the same time like if you think about maybe you can relate to this a lot of the people that we were that i was over there with if we weren't in the military and I just met you on the street, me and you aren't going to be friends. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not going to hang out. We don't like the same shit. We're not the same person, which is fine, you know, but over there, that didn't, that none of that shit mattered, right? Everybody just was there for each other. But, like, looking back on it now, it's like, I understand why they went that way, I went this way, and they went this way. Like, I get it. Just, just we wouldn't have hung out to begin with. Yeah, you go back to your own, yeah. you know, your roots. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of the guys I'm, uh, that was in my platoon, he didn't deploy with us, but he's in my platoon, he went. He had a different mission. He was pulled like out of our platoon and went and did something else. Uh, he lives here in Beaumont, so that's kind of how I got down here in Beaumont, meeting connections, oh, meeting cool. Scott, and all that. Yeah. That's kind of how we all got intermingled. Scott, <laughs> <laughs> that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I talked to him the other day. I talked to him all the time. I love that dude. Bro, he's, he's a trip. He's like a trip. I, every time I call him, like it's at least an hour long conversation. Oh, yeah. There's so much to talk about. Ask him about the time me and him rolled in the hotel room at fire school. Oh, I will. Ask him about that. <laughs> Ask will. him how that went. <laughs> Well, I, that's Love oh, you, Scott. I think he did tell me about that because that's how, like, he told me that you was in jujitsu. Yeah, and he said you uh, was damn good at it. <laughs> but um, and bro, like, I do the same thing. Like, I talk to a few of my buddies every now and then, but it's we're bad about it. We don't talk like, I, 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 man, I honestly feel bad because last February, one of our really, like my like, me and him was in the same fire team. Mm -hmm. He killed himself, and um. Bro, and it talking to another buddy that was really good friends with him. Part of the reason why he did it is because he felt the same thing, like the whole non-deserving thing and not yeah. all that. But like no one, like he felt like no one cared about him, and like no one ever tried to take up on him and stuff like that, bro. And that I found that out, bro. It crushed my Dude, heart. Just yeah. Like yeah. Um, my wife, uh, I was I, I left work, came home, then. I remember my wife being sleeping and she woke up and I was like crying in the living room just because you know like it like I didn't cry initially when I heard that but like it sat on me for like five days mm -hmm. and like I would it crushed me if you know knowing that I I could have been I there could have pre prevented that you know yeah. and um it, it was hard yeah that was very hard and you know they didn't really have a funeral for him and stuff is I don't know what happened with that they were supposed to were supposed to plan the trip and go see his grave but like there was many things that Factored in that, and I don't know the whole story, but there might have been some like financial issues too. He just felt cornered, yeah. And there was and like he felt like no one came to check on him enough, called him enough, and um, and I still after that happened, I've still got no better at it, and I really have to make an 
an intentional decision to do that because no one's going to tell each other if we're struggling. No, I don't know. You know, and <clears throat> if that was the case, he would have told us and we would have been there for yeah. him. But like, you don't. And so it just leaves you in that such a burnable uh, position. Yeah. The next thing you know, it's all, all it is is a trigger squeeze. Yeah. Then it's done. And yeah. have y'all lost to anybody like suicide and stuff like that? We've lost a couple. Um, my first team leader uh, ended up taking his own life. Uh, one guy that actually wasn't on that same deployment as us, but uh, ended up he was in our platoon once we got back. As a private, uh, great soldier, man, he ended up. Uh, I want to say he even went to ended up going to Ranger School. Uh, just a good, good dude. But I mean, and like I said, we weren't super close just because we didn't deploy together. But mm -hmm. we did hang out in the times uh, before I got out. And uh, it's uh, the thing about suicide or depression. You know. You can put on a face. I'm sure I had one on for a long time that mm -hmm. nobody, like you said, you go to work and everything seems fine. Uh, I wouldn't, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit there and tell everybody like, yeah, I just broke the shit out of my wife last night, meant like verbally, I cut her down. I'm not going to tell people that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to tell them that we're fighting, we're talking about a divorce. I'm not going to tell anybody that. I'm going to put on my little face and make sure everything is fine. And uh, Depression looks different on everybody mm -hmm. you know and you never know what somebody's going through no and like when you know, when i get bad off like i don't sleep yeah because for one thing i don't sleep so i just feel so bad about the way i like the maybe what i argued about what i said because anytime like we, we get in a small argument like i've never put my handle cast or anything but we've been in arguments but like just knowing that i upset her to make her cry like bro like it'll keep me up for fucking days yeah for days just because, oh. like, she's just so innocent and non-deserving of what I put her through. And, it, bro, that's when I've had those thoughts. Yeah. That's whenever, like, I felt like, bro, like, she don't deserve me. Yeah. And, like, she ain't going to leave me. Yeah. So, like, I'm going to do her a favor. Yeah. You know? And, um, and but, like, now things have gotten way better. Yeah. And I, because... I just, one thing I care too much, like, I care too much about money. And I care too much about other things and... Uh, I didn't make things about her. So now, like, I try to make things, like, about her yeah. and put her on the forefront. Yeah. And so, like, and, and that's that. Because, bro, like, one of the stupidest arguments we've had that was I, she was ordering too much off of Amazon. <laughs> and it turned into something huge. Yeah. Like, it's nothing ever been serious, yeah. you know. And that's what's crazy. That's how I'm, like, I know that I was a problem. Like, because it would be something so small, then, like, I victimized my thoughts and I kind of, like, I'm like, it's only one-sided. Like, I wasn't putting her self in, uh, in her perspective, but it, bro, it's so stupid. Yeah, a lot of them are. A lot of them start off with something small, and then one thing gets said that sets the other person off, and then it just builds from there, you know, and it's the the thing back to the finger point and say, well, you do this. Well, yeah, but you do this. And it's like, man, that, that, it doesn't help anybody, you know, but that's it's going to happen mm -hmm. in, in a marriage especially. It's gonna, There's going to be hard times, and um, that's what sucks about our situations, marriage is hard enough by itself. You know? mm -hmm. And then you add all these things that they didn't necessarily sign up. Like they, it's like nobody's gonna be like, "Hey, this guy, you're, you can marry this guy if you want." He's gonna come with PTSD, depression, suicidal thoughts, and all this stuff. Or you can marry this guy, who, yeah, maybe you don't like him as much, but he's <laughs> gonna be, he's gonna love you to death forever. He's gonna do everything you want. He's gonna be there, treat you like a princess for the rest of your life. There's going to be women who are like, well, fuck all those problems. You know, I'll take I'll take the easy road. Mm -hmm. And my wife, luckily, is not one of those people. My wife isn't either. Like, bro, like, I do not deserve an inch of no, her. Me neither. Me neither. An inch of her. Because she was an innocent angel. And she still is. And then there's me. Yeah. And, and, but I think, I, th I truly think God strategically placed her there in my life for that yeah. reason. Because if I didn't have her, bro, like, I would be back on drugs. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I'd probably be dead. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that. That'd be my story, yeah. you know. But now we're doing all these other stuff, and, and she motivates me. She empowers me. Like, she believes in me 110%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, try, and I do that for her. Yeah. It's so. It, that's good. That's beautiful, that, man. That rocky road. And 
yours was a little bit longer than mine, but you definitely had a lot more baggage than I did, you know, Um, because your experience was very different. And I think, what do you think is the best way to, you think time is probably the only thing that heals this, or do you think there's other things? And I don't even, like, you know that that old thing, like, time heals all wounds? I think it just kind of numbs it a little bit. It's like uh, my mom died in April of 2016, so we're coming up on seven years now. It doesn't make it any easier that my mom's gone. Like, it doesn't, I'm not any less sad Mm -hmm. to not have my mom here, but it's like the time has kind of been like, well, I mean, seven years now, what am I going to do? Am I going to dwell on it? It's kind of the same thing. Like, you got to learn how to just be a, as normal as you can, if that makes any sense. Like, you can't, you can't let all that stuff, at some point you have to make a decision. Like, I'm going to live, in, I'm going to live my life. And I'm going to make people happy. I'm going to, I deserve happiness. I can do this. I can be happy. Or I'm just going to be a miserable sack of shit mm-hmm. for the rest of my life. I mean, you got to, you got to, at some point you have to be able to do it. It took me a lot longer than I think a lot of people. Um, my fault mostly, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, everybody's mind is different and they, they rationalize things different. They get through things different. You know, some people have talked to me about, you know, why, why don't you do therapy? Which now, honestly, now I'm way more open to therapy. I would mm-hmm. I'd probably, it probably would be a great thing for me to get into now that I'm level headed and I know how to control myself, mm-hmm. and, you know, but then there was no way I was going to sit on a couch with somebody who had never been through most of them haven't even been in the military period, much less a combat situation mm-hmm. or a place like Corngall or Petra River Valley and saw the things that some people saw. And it's like, how are you going to tell me that how I should react to that? Or I just, I, that wasn't for me, you know, and I, I think it is a good tool for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, and even me now, I think it would be a good thing to just to start getting into, but that wasn't going to be my, that wasn't going to be what changed me. And I, and I knew that for a fact. That's one thing I knew for a fact. That's going to be me making mistakes. Unfortunately, I had to make them over and over and over and over because I'm a stubborn motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it took a long time. But now, man, I'm so happy with where I am now. It's, 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 that's what it tells me. Like, I, I wish that we were talking about people that feel alone and they can't reach out because I've been there. I wish more people would, you know, I wish more people would reach out because I, I, I love telling people like there is the other side, there is another side of it, man. I promise there's some people think that that's just, that happened. That's it. That's all my life is going to be. And it doesn't have to be like that. No. And one thing where I experienced, um, definitely now that I'm firefighting now, there's things that bother me way more here. Oh yeah. I'm sure. Than oh. over there. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I respect what y'all do so much, man. Like you can, talk combat all you want, but like the, some of the things that firefighters and police officers and like some of the things y'all see on a daily basis, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it, man. And it's normally ki- like, you know, adults yeah. Yeah, they don't bother me that much, yeah, but the kids. It's, okay. it's them kids, it's the infants, it's anything from probably 18 year old down, yeah. you okay. know, you know, that could have been something, well, they were something in life, but you know, they didn't have a chance, Yeah, you know, that, that fucks with you a little bit. Yeah, those kids, man, completely innocent. Oh, God. Bro, it's bad. But, man, I, I 100% agree. I think time may – I think it just numbs it. Yeah. I don't think it ever leaves away. Um, it makes you, it a little bit easier, but yeah. it doesn't – it's not healed. Like, I still have the same demons. I still – my mm-hmm. mom's still gone. I'm still upset about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if most people are honest with themselves, they've – damn near anybody I know can will probably tell you, if they're honest, I've had suicidal thoughts. Not necessarily I was about to kill myself, but thought of if I did, what would happen? Yeah. You know, who would care? Why would it matter? You know? Bro, I have on a daily basis for yeah. no reason. Yeah. And I didn't know if I was just fucked up in general for that yeah. or well, I don't know. Yeah. But like, and I 100% agree because I, I think that's like a kind of uh, an animal reaction. Yeah. You know, like just. I don't know. It's selfish, too, because, I mean, that would be such a selfish thing, yep. you know, to do. Like, leave, you know, our yep. family behind and, like, yeah, it's horrible. Like, but in that time, you victimize yourself 
Well, that, and that goes then you right feel, along with it, right? Yeah, yeah, you victimize yourself, and like you don't, you're not thinking about all that. You're just being selfish. It, in any situation that you, like that I was in, that I like that, like I was always victimized myself. Yeah, you know. But so, well, you know, with a lot of your struggles and stuff, what did you kind of turn to? Was it alcohol, drugs? Uh, I mean. I guess alcohol, whenever I got back, I didn't really do drugs just because of the jobs that I had. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I could smoke weed, I would still, to this day, I would smoke weed every day because I don't think that's a drug. It helps me. Um, it's just a, I'd be a much happier person and things mm -hmm. would be a lot easier for me. Um, but <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that because of my job. So um, I did for a long time, I guess you can say turn to alcohol. And that's almost the same thing as time, right? It didn't. Mm -hmm. It didn't take the problems away by any means, but it it delays it. Yeah, and I wasn't thinking about it. But what sucks about alcohol is those problems, just like they still are now. Those problems are still there. They didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So if one bad thing happens that is, can set off a chain reaction, and that chain reaction is going to be way worse if you've been drinking than it would have been if you were level-headed and mm -hmm. trying to control your emotions. So yeah, alcohol. Um, alcohol always makes things ten oh, times dude. worse. I love hate relationship with it you know mm -hmm. i love it you know to hang out and have a good time and get loose and chill with my friends mm -hmm. and have a drink with you guys but th like the the downside is it's terrible it's terrible oh for sure everything's got to stay perfect yeah. like you nothing can trigger you make yeah. you mad or anything like that yeah. or like you spiral like especially spiral. especially then like it, mm -hmm. like if it would spiral and it would spiral out of control quickly and like I said, that would be another one of those ones. It's not because I was shit face drunk, but like just I like I would zone out mm -hmm. and I wouldn't know like what the fuck did I do? You know why would I do that? And a lot of times it was because of alcohol. And that's one thing I noticed about, about myself, bro. Especially drinking, like I get upset, bro. I, like I spiral so quick. Yeah, it like goes from zero to a hundred. Yeah, you know, and um, it is it is still them same selfish victimizing thoughts. A lot of times, yeah. But, um, so did you like, when you got out, did you get on like any kind of prescription meds for like PTSD and stuff like well, that? Well, they put me on them, uh, but it made me feel like a fucking zombie. I didn't mm -hmm. like the way I felt on them. Um, so yeah, they put me on them and I kind of weaned myself off, I guess. And, um, I didn't stay on them very long just because dude, I would like, at, before I got out, they had me on the meds and my wife came home to find find us a place to live and i was still at i was still at uh, fort campbell at the apartment and i would just sit there and like do absolutely nothing people would call i would look at my phone and just like throw it i didn't i didn't like the way i felt on them and uh i'm also like i don't want to say anti medication i think there are things in certain situations that people need mm -hmm. certain things you know but if I can, I like to stay off of them, mm -hmm. uh, especially like the antidepressants that change the makeup of your brain and the chemical reactions. And like, like I said, some people I know need it, but I don't feel like I don't feel like I was in that category. I needed to figure out my own shit, mm -hmm. you know, and now I have I'm not on antidepressants. I'm OK. I'm happy and <laughs> like, I don't mean, that's like a that, win, dude. That, that stuff is just I don't know. That that's another one, you know, you start taking pills and changes your chemical makeup and you don't know how some people no. react different to it, you know. And uh that's one thing I was talking to Caleb about, you know, on that podcast mm -hmm. whenever that incident happened and he said like I I've never took it him, so I can't speak on it, but he said it delayed his like grieving process. Like his whole like Yeah. Like his, you know, like it delayed everything. Like mm -hmm. that year or two that he was on him, like he was on him, he was fine or like more or less a zombie because he said that too. But it was just like as soon as he got off of him, it was right back to square one. Yeah. And so, so that yeah. is it worth it then? You know, I think it, it probably is for some, but I think I'd rather just, you know, Hit it in the hit it on the forefront and yeah. just because if you delay it, like that's the thing. Like you had your little girl later on, and you know then it would have delayed longer into yeah. her life. And yeah. I can see where it's like kind of a catch twenty two, you know. Yeah. 
But I agree. Some people probably need them and stuff. Yeah, I'm sure there's certain situations where they do people good. You know, I'm not completely against them. Um, my wife had a very, very bad um, reaction with medications. Uh, and that kind of gave me a different outlook on them as well. Like a, like a allergic reaction or just well, a behavioral? <clears throat> a little bit of both. Like the, It started off as something s- simple. Like she had a cold. So she went and got a, a steroid uh, antibiotic shot. Mm-hmm. Well, she had a bad reaction to antibiotics and <clears throat> uh, started having some problems. And so we went to the doctor. They couldn't find anything. They did a blood work. Everything was fine. So they gave her more antibiotics. Mm. It made the problem worse. She ended up in the hospital. They couldn't find anything in the hospital, feeding her more antibiotics. Um, and all these, it just, it got worse and worse and worse. And nobody could tell us anything. Doctors ran tests. They didn't see anything. It took us, it took her finding a holistic doctor to say, to run these tests and say, hey, look, the antibiotics have crushed your, you have no bacteria left in your stomach. The So now, she, now my wife, she is the least picky eater I've ever met. She will eat anything. She will try anything. Not a picky eater. I'm the complete opposite. She, I could live on chicken nuggets and pizza. <laughs> she is the complete opposite, man. She will eat anything. She will try anything. Now, to this day, she cannot eat gluten. She cannot have dairy, and if she does, it puts her in this like week long, like she can't do it. She can't like she can't function. So her wow. body will shut down. She'll be itching. She'll get sick, just from all those antibiotics. It completely changed her life. Dude, that's crazy. Everything Wait. was one hundred percent normal one day, and then the next day it changed. Mm. Bro, with the medicine and farm agenda, like I don't trust any of them. Yeah, regardless. Oh man, but it's all about money for the oh month, for know? sure, bro. And, like, you can't tell me, like, cancer can't be cured when okay. you can put a fucking man on the moon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's what, you know, we're dealing with that with my grandpa right now, bro. And this is... Not in 2023. There's got to be something. Oh, yeah, for real. And it, that's... And that didn't help anything either. You know, my grandpa getting cancer. And I'm sure when your mom got cancer, mm-hmm. it didn't help you at all. It, and that's been a struggle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that I'm sure. Because, I mean, I know. I mean, it's... Especially when we found out that she was, you know, terminal. Mm-hmm. It's like I kind of she called me. I knew she had had I knew she had cancer and she was getting some some tests done or whatever. And uh, I was at work one day and she said, "Hey, we're all at uh, my grandma's house." She said, "We're all hanging out over here. Can you stop by when you get off work?" I was like, "So I leave work and I go over there, and that's whenever she says uh, tells me that it's terminal. We're not going to be able to do anything. It's I'm, I'm going to die." And I just kind of sat there and I was like, "Man, this is my mom. Like she is. She was my." My number one my entire life. This is my mom. She's telling me she's not going to make it. Like, for sure, she's going to die. And I just kind of sat there, and I looked at her. But everybody was, like, looking at me, waiting for my reaction. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what the fuck you mean? She was like, yeah, I'm, it's terminal. There's nothing they can do. And I just, like, sat there for a second. I was like, fuck off. Like, there's no fucking way. Yeah. And I got up, and I went and gave everybody a hug. I gave her a kiss on the forehead, and I left. Like, there's, I'm not going to sit here in this room full of people staring at me, waiting for me to cry. I'm just fucking, I got to go. And so I left. I went straight to jujitsu class, and my instructor was. I told him because, like, at this time, me and him were really good friends already. Yeah. You know, and he saw that I was upset, and I talked to him when I got there, and um, he's like, "Well, what are you doing here?" And then I just kind of like had some tears in my eyes, whatever. Went to the back and got changed, and he told me that after that class, he's like, "Man, as soon as I asked him that, I said that's that's because this is where he needs to be. Like, this mm-hmm. is this is what's gonna help him. And like, jujitsu was a <clears throat> it's a it's a really good outlet. It's something that's fucking hard. Mm-hmm. It's fucking hard, right? And like it, it didn't. It didn't. I don't want to say it changed my. I mean, it did change my life in certain aspects. But for me, it was just that for those two hours, two and a half hours, however long I'm there, nothing else was on my mind. Mm-hmm. That was it. Every, all this darkness was gone. All the bullshit was gone. All all my fears, all the things I was mad about, all the guilt, all the everything was gone. And so that's what that's what made me start training more. So man, I did jujitsu for years. That was before I went in the military. Mm-hmm. I haven't really done anything once I got out. Mm-hmm. You know, um, to me, works that. Yeah, you well, know, especially your line of. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. works my outlet. Yeah, and definitely working out too, lifting weights yeah. and stuff. But like, still lifting weights, bro. Like, it's hard for me to lift weights when I got when I'm carrying baggage that mm-hmm. day. Like, I can't focus and stuff. But when I'm at work, like, it really shuts me out from yeah. everything. And, bro, like, I've done things that, like, 
here recently that I'm not happy about is like I use work to escape every, mm-hmm. like as an escape. Yeah. Like I use work so I don't have to go home and like deal with, you know, those feelings towards my grandpa and stuff. Like, yeah. And, um, and I know that I'm doing this because it's, it's intentional, but man, it sucks. But it's, it's so hard seeing him how he is. Then I use work as an outlet mm. and, or as a, a safe haven. So I don't experience those feelings. Yeah. And it's, bro, it's rough. Oh, yeah. And jujitsu and stuff, that's, I need to get back in it. Uh, there's actually. Uh, even I need to get, dude, I haven't been in months. With all this house stuff going on, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't done anything. I, I stopped going to the gym. I, I quit doing jujitsu. I say I quit. I mean, I just haven't gone to jujitsu. Uh, it's, if I'm not at work, I was dealing with house stuff, you know, and now that things are finally starting to, to level back out, I'm going to get back into both for sure. But it's just, uh, it, I loved it. I, I still do. I love it. Cause man, a lot of people, so the guy that owns a jujitsu gym, um, back home. So it used to be TPC, they shut mm-hmm. down, whatever. But, uh, Tony Cruz, he's a firefighter in Nacogdoches and he's also a Marine. Uh, he's got a pretty big gym now. Really? Yeah. I think he's a black belt now. Uh, he started it, I think, when he was like a blue belt or a purple belt, something mm-hmm. like that. But but he's grown it, and um, I hear it's a great class. Yeah. And he's, um, I don't know which style they operated in, you know. Uh, the E-Barbers, bro, they had a legit. Oh, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, bro, they, they're, they're awesome. it was legit. And um, But so going into a different gym, you know, seeing like some maybe different styles and dif- different teachings might be interesting. But it was, it'd be hard to top them. Oh, man, they were, they're, and like I'm, I'm biased. I mean, that was my first and only, you know, but Hoist Gracie Black Belts, um, dude, I mean, when you earn your belt there, I'm not saying other places you don't, you know, but I know for a fact that if they put a belt on me, if they put a belt on mm-hmm. me, that means they know that, I, that that belt is going to, I'll be all right. Because Pat Hardy, you know, I think Hoist Gracie even said it, you know, a belt only covers two inches or ass, you got to take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. So you can put a blue belt, purple belt, brown belt on anybody, but you're going to have to go train or compete against other blue, purple, brown, mm-hmm. black belts. And you can wear whatever color belt you want. <laughs> but it's going to show yeah. whenever you're there, you know, and that's, that's what I love about it. And I like the, the attention to detail, the little bitty minute details that change everything. That, that's, I love that place, man. It's awesome. And I think like all this boils down to like where we find safe haven in that is that it goes back to giving ourselves a sense of purpose, mm-hmm. you know, and purpose th- and for me, I'm not, not, not yeah, I'm going to cut you off, but like purpose and something hard, something that's going to challenge me. If I don't feel challenged, dude, I get bored mm-hmm. and I will not give my all to anything if it, I don't feel like it challenges me. And um, that, that's that been a big thing. Like, in, like, I don't love my job, you know, I don't I don't love my job. It's just I, what I've worked, the, the position I am in now is makes it more enjoyable because it's more of a challenge as far as figuring things out, problem solving and, you know, making it fixing it and making it work and you get that sense of accomplishment of solving the puzzle mm-hmm. or whatever but it's just not like i need something that's why jujitsu is just perfect man it's fucking hard mm-hmm. it is hard and you go in there even even i don't care how what rank you are you go in there you get your ass kicked because there's nothing but people in there that are like-minded you know and that are training their ass off and just trying to get better and it's it's fucking hard and i love it and I'm sure there's a sense of, well, there was, like a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood sure, yeah. within the gym. Yeah. You know, and that's always something I cling to as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm always searching for. That's probably the only reason why I am a firefighter Yeah. is because of that brotherhood, that sense of purpose and everything else. And that, for sure, was my biggest struggle getting out is losing that purpose because I was <laughs> in the, you know, Marines, and everyone thought I was going to be in there forever because, you know, like I was, you know, graduated top of my class and everything as well as, like, one Marine of the Year, and, like, they thought of me as a lifer. And I got out, bro. It surprised a lot of people yeah, because it was over some bullshit. You know, like, I was – it was time for me to get out mm-hmm. because society and things were changing. People wasn't yeah. hard, you know. And so I got out, but I'm glad I did because yeah. um, none of this would be such a thing. Yeah. But outside of, like, survivor's guilt and stuff and everything else, do you feel like a lot of your – feelings like kind of dwelled down to like losing that sense of purpose because like bro you're in you're in afghanistan and whatever rank you are like you're in charge of all this equipment you're in charge of like like your duties and your purpose there is your brother's is life yeah you know and there's nothing that really triumphs that yeah that's a lot of responsibility bro and like when you come out to 
back to civilian world, like, bro, you're, no, you don't matter no more. Mm-hmm. No. no one, don't, no one knows your name. No one gives a shit about you. Like, yeah. it's it. Yeah. And that was hard. That was hard to eat. It is. It is. It's definitely a culture shock. You know, you go from such a tight knit group and such a God, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's, it's just like you go through something with those people that you're never going to, it doesn't matter what kind of friends you have back home, right? You're never going to go through those things with them mm-hmm. unless fucking Russia comes over here and does some crazy shit, you know? Yeah, for real. But it's like, you're, I'm never going to go through that with anybody else besides those guys I went through it with. And for me, like, I don't necessarily want to say sense of purpose for me personally, but it was like the, they understood me, mm-hmm. you know, and, now I don't have that. I don't have that circle anymore, you know. And that—that's. I think that was a big. That was a big part for me. Like yeah. they, they understood me. They knew me. They knew what we went through. Nobody else does. So and at the same time, I don't want to explain it to anybody. I don't want to tell you what I went through yeah. because you're not going to understand. You're not going to give a fuck in the day. You know? Exactly. And so you just essentially, it's just you felt alone. Yeah. Alone. Yeah. And which I felt that too. Even and this is like a hard concept for my wife to really understand. It's like. You know, technically or physically, I'm not alone, but you are. Like, you yeah. know, I have my wife, I have my family, and I love them to death. They'll always be the most of me. But, like, there's still a sense of loneliness that you're not in that brotherhood, you're mm-hmm. not in that culture, you're not you're not the person that you was, yeah. you know. And it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to cope. And and that's another word she gets confused about is my sense of purpose, you know, my outlook on that. It's like she is more than I'll ever need – whatever but it's just that like she's my purpose but there's this whole nother side of me like going to afghanistan you know doing our thing over there was my purpose yeah from little yeah. i knew that and it now and that was a different that was definitely a life-changing decision that i made and i got out and it felt different I'll yeah tell you, it felt different and so going on now you know do you ever worry about like having maybe a relapse to like some of the feelings you had <clears throat> I think I'm 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 in a pretty good I'm in a pretty good fucking spot mentally right now, um, and the only reason I know that for a fact is all the stress that we've gone through this year mm-hmm. with the the moving and the the house stuff. You know, it's if this if we would have gone through this five years ago, dude, mm-hmm. I would have I don't know I don't know how to handled it. Um, it's just it's still hard, you know, but I've kind of. I've learned, I've learned how to deal with it, and I've learned that it's okay for somebody to love. You. It's okay mm-hmm. for your wife to love you. Let her, let her mm-hmm. fucking love you. If she's still there, she fucking loves you. You know, Not for sure. Let her do it. Let for her sure. do it, and then love her back. That was the other big one, mm-hmm. right? Like, I've always loved her. Like that has never been a question. I've always loved her. I just didn't show her, and that goes back to the self sabotage, and that goes back to the pushing away, not feeling like you deserve it, and you do, man. Because they're trying does. to understand. Yeah. They bro, they'd probably give up everything to understand. And they, they don't under and they don't understand like why you feel this way and stuff. Yeah. And it's something that you just can't teach. You have to go through it. Yeah. You know? And it's <laughs> and I doubt my innocent wife was gonna go to Afghanistan <laughs> or go through the Marine Corps to understand yeah. that. So and it's 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 awkward. It's awkward, it's weird, it's uh just different you know, that relationship, but you have to find some way to find peace in it and mm-hmm. find peace in yourself to be able to just continue life, bro. Cause you, if you, there's no way in hell that I would want to experience the rest of my life with those feelings, you know, yeah. cause bro, it'd be miserable. Like you don't like, you don't deserve to be miserable mm-hmm. the rest of your life, No, you know, but if, if we let ourselves do that, we will yeah. indirectly like broke as time flies, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm sure, you know, through your period of struggle, how long did you struggle for? Man, it, it's a good assault. Like, before I got to where I felt like I knew what I deserved and what I wanted and what I needed and the ability to accept that from other people, probably almost about 10 years. Bro, and how quick did that 10 years fly by? Pretty quick. Pretty quick. I mean, at, at the going through it, you know, it felt like slow, you know, mm-hmm. but looking back on it now, it was 10 years flew. And, like, what what sucks now is – as happy as I am now and the things that I have now, like if I've done that over the last couple of years, what could I have done in that 10 year span? You know, if I could have, if I could have figured that out in the first year or two and figured, 
like gotten to the point where I'm now back then, fuck, there's no telling, you know. So from what you learned with in that ten year period, what advice would you give somebody that might be experiencing this right now? There is another side. There is another side to it. And I know there's a big stigma on men's mental health. You know, everybody says, you know, or you feel like you should be a tough motherfucker. Nothing's going to bother me. And if it does, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to be a man about it. That's all good, you know, and you can make it out. Some people can make it out that way, but there's an easier way because that a lot of times that just leads to a lot more darkness and way, way, way deeper than you should be going Mm -hmm. up here. Um, those, those suicidal thoughts are real, you know, like you might say like, yeah, I'm never going to do it, but sit there in those thoughts for four or five years, Mm -hmm. see where you're at then, you know, see where you're at 10 years in. It's, if you let those thoughts beat you, they will, and they'll, they will fucking, they will suck you up and spit you out. And the most dangerous thing I think possibly is that you go through this at such a young age where you're not mentally mature Mm -hmm. and you go in to try to tackle life, you know, like you're not thinking mature. Like you're not thinking about anything else. Like even just being at that age, you have selfish decisions and you make, you have selfish habits. Yeah. And so there's a lot of things I didn't realize until like, bro, I'd probably say a year or two ago and I'd like turn 24 to 25. Like, I'm like, you know, and I think a lot of that came with like reading books and stuff like that. I kind of educate myself, but I think even if I would have not have done that, I still think I would have been, I would have had a different mindset, you know, just being at a more mature age. Mm -hmm. Because that's the thing, bro. Like, you go through these times, you're young. You're still a kid. Yeah. You're still a kid. And, like, with this testosterone, especially, like, coming back and seeing all that, like, how do you articulate that? You articulate it through anger, violence, and everything else, and drugs, drinking, and partying Mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so that doesn't help any factor either. No. I mean, our our year was, our deployment was go, 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 nonstop, 24-7 for a year. And then you come back, and it's just silent. Like, what the fuck? Like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> driving down the road, I mean, for a while, driving down the road, I don't want to be on the sides of the road. I want to be in the middle lane. You know, mm-hmm. all that shit that you hear about, the PTSD stuff, you know. It's, it's <clears throat> I don't want to say it's dumb because it's not. I mean, it's there for a reason. That's a legit, it's a legit thing. But if you let it beat you, it will. Mm-hmm for as long as you let it. So, like, what, like, marriage advice would you give for somebody that's been through your stuff that might be experiencing the same struggles you have? Mm, That's a good question. (sighs) I'm asking for myself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, that that also goes back to a personal level. Like, if if you're not going to let your wife be there for you, She's only going to sit there and put up with that shit for so long. Mm-hmm. That's why I said I'm lucky enough that she stayed for as long as she did. You know, um, let her be there. You deserve it. You know, and you you got to be able to tell yourself that you deserve it, and that you know if you if you break yourself down constantly, constantly, it's going to be hard for your wife to. She's going to give up. Like she's sitting there trying to do the best she can. You know, like nothing. She's going to start thinking like nothing I do is good enough. Nothing I do is helping them. Mm-hmm. You know, what am I doing? Like, you know, and then on the other, on the flip side of it, he's also breaking me down. Like, what's she getting out of it? She wasn't getting any, like, mm-hmm. hardly anything. Like, now, no, it wasn't a 24-7 thing. It was mainly when you, when we fought or whatever, but still. Um, you, people, you, you got to be able to tell yourself that you deserve love and you deserve mm-hmm. respect. And um, you have to be able to give that back, too, you know. Mm-hmm. And if you have a woman who's standing there by your side, who's not sitting there dogging you all the time, telling you you're a piece of shit, and you know. That's a, you. You got a good one if she's sticking by your side. You know, mm-hmm. you just gotta, you gotta tell yourself, that's all. You gotta compartmentalize. That was in the past. That was then. This is now. Because if you let that carry on, it'll carry on as long as you let it. You know, once you once you just make that decision, like, hey, I'm gonna change, figure out your outlet, and change. You know, because bro, we have some strong wives. Because yeah. For them staying or not cheating or doing other stuff, like yeah. bro, like if I was probably in Cassidy's shoes, I probably would have broke up with me the first six months huh. of being with me. You know, like yeah. I wouldn't. Have, why in the hell would I? This dude's fucked. Yep. Get the fuck out of here. Yep. Too <laughs> you much know? baggage. I, I, we definitely have some strong lives because, and like you know, like I will never owe somebody 
more than what I owe Cassidy. Mm-hmm. You know, just for what she's put up with. Yeah. And, um, bro, that's so true because they 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 did not sign up for that. Because mm-hmm. not at that level because they could think. They could think they did. They can, like, they can, you can only visualize so much, but, like, when it really comes to the nitty gritty, like when they experience that, they're they're probably like, bro, like I did not expect this. Yeah, this, this is, is bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, this you know, <laughs> like why am I with this crazy motherfucker? Yeah, I'm sure she thought that ten times a day, if not. And more. they just have such a strong amount of resilience just to be there. Yeah. You know, because you know, the, and like I hope Cassidy never felt this way, but I hope she didn't stay with me just because she felt bad for me. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I know that's a that's a thing too, you know, and luckily, in my case, anyways, I feel like, in my opinion, I've, I've came out of it a better person, you know. So, if I would just come out of it and like we gave up on each other afterwards, dude, that'd be such a fucking dude. That would suck so bad, mm-hmm. you know. And after everything that we went through, to just give up now, that would God, dude, that would suck. But it's 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 nice to have somebody that with a backbone like that who's willing. You know that you know loves you, you know it because if mm-hmm. they went, if they didn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be there. You know, like you said, they could have left, they could have cheated, they could have done whatever they wanted at any point in time, mm-hmm. but they're still there. And uh, you talk about your friend that always also was there for the thick and thin of it. You know, I have a buddy like that too, uh, Casey, and bro, he's been there. He gives me a hard time. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> like it gives me definitely a hard time, and he keeps me humble because he like. Um, bro, he just gives you a hard time. Like anything you do, whatever, he's like, you know, quit being a pussy and mm-hmm. all this, what, whatnot. But that's important too. Yeah, to have friends like that. He wasn't even in the military. His brother mm-hmm. was a marine. Brother went to Afghanistan, and but like in case he's not experienced none of none of that, his resilience through like me having a conversation with him and stuff, and just kind of dealing with my shenanigans. You that speaks that means a lot to me. Well, yeah, you know. Because, you know, your brothers that you serve with, like, you expect that out of, mm-hmm. out of them. But for someone that didn't have that same experience or whatever, like, it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know. And he's been my, my childhood friend from start to finish, you know. We've always been really, really close. But he's also somebody that keeps me accountable, too. Mm-hmm. Like, very accountable. And I think that's important. <laughs> Man, it's, it's, it's some hard topics to talk, talk about. Like, this is not the, the easy stuff. And especially not the easy stuff to put this on camera and – you know, and let it off to the world. But with our intentions with this is just to help other people that, like, the people that, ex- I know there's other guys that experience the same thing, and not just the military with, like, fire, or police, or any kind of trauma in life. Like, um, I'm sure you experience these feelings, and you're not the only one that has. And hopefully you can learn, uh, listen to this podcast and learn something from it, and hopefully we gave good advice to you. Um, you know, Blake, thank you for the things that you've done. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast, man. So I didn't think it was going to happen. You know, I messaged you that first time on Facebook and whatnot, and it seemed like pretty much a no. Yeah. But then, like, two weeks later, you text me back, and you just probably shit-faced. And like, <laughs> no problem about it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, okay, we're going to do it. Then I was like, bro, I was so excited. But, man, I really do. Yeah, thank man. you, man. Thank it you means all. a lot. Yeah. And so, guys, uh, this podcast will be out Wednesday. Uh, so excited to put it out, and uh, hopefully you get something from it. Thank you guys for watching.